Hey guys, thanks for joining Learn to Play. My name is Lance, and today we're going to take a look at Zombicide Black Plague. This is Cool Mini or Not and Guillotine Games' newest take into the Zombicide universe. With this one, it is a fantasy setting, so you're going to have elves and dwarves, wizards and sorcerers, and many other characters in it. As usual, Zombicide, it's a 1-6 to six player, fully cooperative game, where the players are playing different survivors, and they have to go on a quest to complete different objectives and do different things while holding back the zombie horde. If you have one of the expansions or the hero pack, you can bump it all the way up to 1 to 12, as you see in this chart below. A typical game takes between 45 minutes and 3 hours, depending upon the quest you go on, how many tiles you're using, and how many survivors you have playing. So with this, Guillotine Games has gone back in and revamped the rules. They've streamlined some stuff and made some things harder. I do really like a lot of the changes that they've made, and as you, you'll see in this video, I'll show you a lot of those new features. So let's head to the table and I'll teach you how to play. Alright, so another new feature to Zombicide Black Plague are the dashboards. At the beginning of the game, each survivor will gain one of these dashboards and will choose a survivor to play as, and place them in the middle. Once they've done this, they will choose a color peg to represent them, and they will gain the clip that goes on the survivor miniature that they have as well. They will place a peg for their wounds, for their three abilities as they gain them, and one in their starting ability, which is their blue level. As the survivors gain experience by killing zombies and picking up objectives, they will gain points and move them into the higher colors. So once they move into yellow, they would gain a new ability. And once they move into orange, they would choose one of these new abilities to be their new permanent ability. And would mark it, and the same for red, they would choose one and mark it. The dashboards also provide slots for their hand weapons that are equipped, and they have backpack slots, and they also have a slot now for armor or each survivor can equip something else in that slot as well. Alright, so next we're going to go ahead and cover setup. So the first thing we're going to do during setup is to choose a mission or quest to go on. You can either choose one of the ten that are in the book, or you can create your own. For this video I've gone ahead and chose the big game hunting scenario, which is quest one. So once you're done with that, then you set up the board the way it shows in the book and you can go ahead and check the special rules to see if there's any particular things that you need to include in the setup. For example, in the big game hunting scenario, there are seven objectives. One of those objectives has a blue X, which is placed randomly in the seven objectives when you deploy them. From there, then you'll go ahead and set up all the doors and spawn points, any vault entrances that you may have, and any other tokens that need to go out. Once that's done, then if there's any vaults in play, then you're going to go ahead and grab the two vault cards, shuffle them up, and randomly deal them into each one of the vaults, or if there's only one vault, then just one of them. Once you have your board completely set up, then the survivors make sure that they have their dashboard, and they've chosen their survivor, and they'll choose a color to go along with them, and then they'll go ahead and place the color ring underneath the survivor. Once that's done, then you'll go ahead and grab the six starting equipment cards that are gray backed, and they also stay starting equipment at the bottom here. Each player will choose one piece of starting equipment to start the game with, and each one of the particular survivors has a piece of equipment then they, that they work best with. So you can choose to give them the appropriate one, or you can just choose one that you'd like to play with. So we're going to go ahead and take Silas and give him the short bow. Baldrick will go ahead and take the Mana Blast, and Nelly will get a Short Sword. Once that's done, then the players can talk amongst themselves and decide who wants to be the first player. When they decide that, they'll give the first player token to that player. So we're going to go ahead and try to head up and open that door. So we need somebody that can open the door, so we're going to go ahead and give the first player token to Nelly. And from there, then we're ready to start the mission. Right, so starting with Nelly, each survivor will get to take a turn, and during a survivor's turn, they're allowed to perform up to three actions. When they're starting out, when they move into yellow, that'll increase to four actions. But for right now, since everybody's in blue, each survivor will get three actions that they can use to do various things. 
Alright, so now I'd like to go over some of the equipment cards you're going to find in Zombie Side. On the top of the card, it's going to list the name of the item. And on the side, it's going to show whether or not it can be dual wielded. If it has the picture of crossed swords, it can. And if it has the eight sided star, it cannot. On the other side, it's going to have a picture of where that item can be used. So with weapons, they must be equipped in the survivor's hand to use them. Armor must be equipped in an armor slot, and some items can be used from the backpack. After that, if an item can open a door, it's going to show a picture of a door. And with a lot of the items now, they actually have to successfully open the door with a check. When they do, they will roll the number of dice that item has, and they must roll equal to or greater than the value listed by the door. And they, most of them will also make noise, which will show a picture of a noise token. On the bottom of the weapon cards, you also have four slots. The first one is the range of that weapon. The second is the picture of the dice, which shows the number of dice that you will throw when you make an attack with that weapon. After that, you have the bullseye, which is the number that you have to roll on those dice equal to or greater than the score hit. And with weapons that have multiple dice, each successful roll will cause a hit. After that, you have a picture of a skull, which is the amount of damage that, that item does. And lastly, we also will tell if the item makes noise when it makes an attack. Okay, so in Zombie Side, there are five different types of zombies you're going to face. The first one is walkers, which are one point of damage to kill, and they get one activation point. After that, you have fatties that are two points of damage to kill, which means that you have to have a weapon that does at least two points of damage, and they get one activation point. Runners are one point of damage to kill, and they will get two activation points. After that, you have the Abomination, which gets one activation point, and these guys are three damage to kill. So the only way you can kill them is by throwing Dragon Bile and then lighting them on fire with a torch to create Dragon Fire. They are five experience points, though, when you kill them, where each of the other zombies are one point of experience. And the last is the Necromancer, which is also one point of damage to kill, and he gets one activation point. Alright, so the first thing we're going to cover is movement, and in Zombie Side, all movement is done orthogonally. There is no diagonal movement allowed. So, for your streets, each street zone is separated by linear lines, so this would be considered one zone and one zone. Inside buildings, the walls will separate the different rooms, and some rooms will be bigger than others. So, each one of these spaces would count as one action point for the survivor to move to it. Another thing to keep in mind is if a survivor is moving from space to space and there happens to be zombies in it, so let's say that uh, Nelly was here and she wished to move out of this space with those zombies, she would have to spend one action point plus an additional action point for every zombie that's in that room, uh, that space, in order to move out of it. So for example, she would have to spend one action point plus one, two action points for a total of three to move out of that space. So as you can see, if there was a lot of zombies in that space, it would be impossible for Nelly to move away. Alright, so when a survivor is in a space that's next to a door, and they happen to have a weapon that allows them to attempt to open a door, which Nelly does, she has the short sword, they can spend an action to try to open that door, so let's go ahead and do that. So Nelly, with the short sword, has gets to throw one dice, because that's the number of dice that the short sword has, and we'll need a 4+, plus, which Nelly rolls. So when we open a door, it does make noise. So we'll put a noise token in that space. And then we're going to go ahead and flip that door open. And the first time that a door is opened and exposes rooms in a building, we will also spawn zombies in those rooms. So we're going to go ahead and flip over a zombie spawn card, which are the yellow-backed cards. And then we're going to go ahead and look at all the different survivors and check where their experience levels are at. All of ours are at blue, but if one of them happened to be higher, say in the yellow, then we would have to go off of that value and go off the yellow value on the spawn card. But since we're all in blue, then we were going to get two walkers in that first room. And in the second room, we will get one fatty. Alright, so the next action a survivor can perform is a search action which they can do when they're inside a, a building, inside a room that has no zombies in it. They can perform a search action once per turn. This includes a free search action. 
When they do this, they would draw the top card from the equipment deck, which is the red deck, and reveal it. When they do that, they would place it in either one of their hands or in their, in their backpack, and at that point, then they're allowed to freely change out any of their equipment that they have. So if they get a new piece of equipment that's good and they want to change it for something else, they can do that. They can also drop any equipment at any point in time for free, just in case they need to make room for different things or they don't need a particular item anymore. Alright, so now we're going to go ahead and take a look at some of the other actions that survivors can perform during their turns. The first one is to reorganize their inventory or to perform a trade with another survivor that's in the same space as they are. So they would spend one action and then they can reorganize their inventory. So a survivor, say Nelly, could change out things that she had in her backpack with uh, things that she had in her hands. Or she can initiate a trade with another survivor and when they do that then they can trade any items that they have and or give items away that they have. After they're done then each of the survivors, the one that traded and the one that did the trading, are allowed to reorganize their inventories for free. The next action we're going to go ahead and look at is for a survivor that is in the same space as an objective may spend an action point to interact with that objective or to take it. So when you do that, you can check it to see if it's the one you're looking for, if the mission calls for it, remove it from the map, and with most of the missions you'll also gain 5 experience points for picking up that objective. So then you would go ahead and advance your experience track by 5 points. After that, the next one we have is the enchantment one. So if a survivor has enchantments equipped in their hands, they may cast those once per turn. They can either cast them on themselves, or if they have direct line of sight to another survivor, they may cast them on that survivor. Uh, enchantments can only be cast once per turn per enchantment that the survivor has equipped, and they do make noise. So you would put a noise token down each time you cast one. After that, we have an option for the survivors to make noise. So when they do this, for every action point they spend, they would put a noise token into their area, which will be covered a little bit later as to the effects of it. And the last thing survivors have is to do nothing. If they've performed a couple of actions and they don't wish to do anything else, they can choose to pass and forego any actions that they have left at which point it would pass to the next survivor, or if it's the last survivor to go, it would move into the zombie phase. Alright, so the next action we're going to look at is the combat action, which is broken down into three different types of attacks. You have melee, ranged, and magic. So we're going to take a look at each one of these and go over some of the details of it. So the first one we're going to look at is melee. We have Nellie here, who is in the same space as a zombie, so she can take her use her short sword to make a melee attack against that zombie, and she has to have the sword equipped in one of her hands, which she does, so she's going to go ahead and it, with the sword it allows her to roll one dice, and she's going to need a four better to cause a wound. She went ahead and rolled a five, so she's going to go ahead and choose which zombie to do damage against. So we only have one walker in the space, so she's going to go ahead and kill that walker. And she'll receive experience for that. But let's go ahead and say, for example, that she happened to have a runner, a walker, and a fatty in that space. When she performs a melee attack that successfully hits, as long as she can do enough damage to it, she's free to choose any one of those models to target. So if the runner is the biggest threat to her, she can go ahead and kill him instead of going in priority. So after that, then we're going to go ahead and take a look at a ranged attack. So we have Silas here, who has two ranged weapons that have a range of 0 to 1, so he's, gonna, he's exactly two spaces away now. So let's go ahead and spend one of his actions to move him up, and then he can go ahead and perform a ranged attack. So he has a repeating crossbow equipped, which lets him throw three dice, and he's going to need a five or better to score a hit. So we're going to go ahead and roll. And he rolls a six, a two, and a three, so he successfully hits one target. With ranged combat, any attacks that successfully hit go against the zone itself, and then the damage is dealt in a priority order, which would be the walkers first, and then a fatty or abominations if they're in the square. After that, then would be runners, 
and finally Necromancers. So with him only scoring one successful hit, the walker is the one that'll die, even though the, the runner might be the one that they would choose to get rid of first because of the threat. But because of priority, then the walker would be the one that was removed. The last one we're going to look at is the monoblasts, or the magic attack, from Baldric. And that works exactly the same way as ranged combat, in that it would target the space and follows priority order, and you would have to have range to it. Other than that, the only other thing that we need to talk about is with ranged or magic attacks, if a survivor is in the same space as zombies and you wish to shoot into that space, there is a chance that you'll hit the survivor. So when you roll for an attack, if you roll any misses, the misses are directed against the survivor. The survivor is allowed to take any armor saves that they happen to have. But any failed saves, that rep, whatever that weapon does damage, will equal how much damage that survivor will take. So if the weapon does two damage, the survivor would take two wounds. Alright, so now that all of our survivors have activated, it's time for the zombies to take their turn. So during the zombie turn, the first thing they're going to do is activate and move towards the survivors that they can either see or they're going to go towards the source of most noise. With Just like the survivors, the zombies are going to only move orthogonally. There will be no diagonal movement for the zombies. And that the same goes for drawing line of sight. So at this point, we can see that this space has one noise token on it. This space has one noise token on it and one survivor for a total of two points of noise. And the last square has two survivors, two noise tokens for a total of four points of noise. So this is the, the tile that most of the zombies are going to go towards unless they can draw a direct line to another survivor. Okay, so this the walkers get to activate one time and they're going to move forward one space. If they happen to be in the same space as a survivor when they activate, then they will do one point of damage to that survivor. So with these guys, they're going to go through the door and come out into the street. The fatty is going to move towards the open door. And this last set of zombies will move forward. Okay, so at this point, all the zombies have moved. And now it's the end of the zombie phase where we will do spawnings. So each spawning point will spawn new zombies. And we'll do it just like we did before with the building. We'll flip over a spawning card for each space, starting with the top one. And again, we'll reference all three of the survivor's experience tracks. And based on whichever one is the highest will be the level that we'll spawn on. Right now, all of our survivors are blue level. So the first card we flipped over gives us two walkers. So we'll put two walkers up top. The next spawn point over here will give us a fatty and then the last point last spawn point down here has nothing and as you can see with this one this was an extra activation so all runners would have gotten an extra turn if we would have been in yellow orange or red level all right so the next thing I like to cover are the new double spawn cards to zombie side black plague so with these cards they're in the spawn deck and when you pull one of them so let's say we pulled this one for this spawning point up here. When that happens, you would not spawn any zombies from this spawning point, and then you would move to the next spawning point, which would be this one, and you would draw two zombie cards. If one of those happened to be a double spawn, then that one would carry over to the following spawning point. And if you happen to draw two double spawns in a row after a double spawn on the next tile, then they would both go to the third tile and you would draw four zombie cards. Alright, so the next thing I'd like to go over is another new feature to Zombieside Black Plague, which is the Necromancer. So, with the Necromancer, when you draw his card from the spawning deck, you're going to add his a spawning token with the Necromancer side face up to that, that area that you spawned him in. So let's say that we, we pull that card for this area here. So we would add his token, and then we'll add the model. And anytime a Necromancer gets summoned, then we're also going to add extra zombies to that area. So you'd flip over the next card, and with all of our survivors still being in blue, we would add a runner to that space. Now once that's done, 
there's a, the necromancer works in a couple of different ways. First off, he's not as concerned with the other the other survivors as zombies are. Unless he's in the same square as a, as another survivor, he's going to move towards the closest spawning point that he can reach, except for his own. Unless it's the only spawning point on the board. So Every time a Necromancer card is drawn, if he's already on the board, he will move one space closer to that spawning point that he's trying to get to. If he reaches that spawning point and is activated again, he will move off the board and his spawning point will be turned over and will be a, a, considered a full-fledged spawning point for the rest of the game. If, he, if the survivors are able to kill him on his way to another spawning point, then when they kill him, they can choose to either remove his spawning point that he brought with him, or they can remove any other spawning point on the board already. So that can change the dynamic of how the board works, and the survivors can tailor it a little bit towards their needs. Alright, so another new feature to Zombieside Black Plague are vaults, or the secret rooms, which there's the violet and the yellow one. They also have hatches that go along with them that are color-coded. So when a survivor opens up one of the hatches, it works just like a regular door, unless the quest specifically says otherwise. When they open it, they'll, they'll gain access to the vault, which they'd spend one activation point to move down to. In the vault, sometimes there will be vault items that they can pick up. Those are not considered uh, search actions, so if there's multiple items down there, the survivor can pick them up for one action apiece. There is no direct line of sight from the vault to the rooms on the outside, so a survivor will not be able to shoot from inside the vault. Zombies will also use those doorways once they're open. And the other thing with vaults is it's also a quick way to get around the board. So when you go down into the vault, you can come back up through the door you went through, or you can open the other door uh, or secret hatch that that vault has and come out into that room. And as usual, when you open this door, and if this room has not been exposed, then you would spawn zombies in that room. 